Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this episode, which is episode 37 of the Art as Well. It's Saturday. It's actually Easter Saturday, so a very happy Easter to all of you, wherever you are. Um, now, before we, we, we start with our guest interview this morning, um, I want to give a special mention to a previous uh, speaker, a guest speaker, um, Colleen Blackard. Um, Colleen has got a, an exhibition, a solo exhibition, starting this morning at 12 noon her time in Houston, Texas. And uh, we wish her uh, every, every success with that. I've actually got one picture to show you. This is one of her works and she uses an archival pen to produce this. I mean, th this is actually massive. It's six foot wide, would you believe, uh, by about four foot deep. And um, it's entitled Fate and it's part of our abandoned series. Uh, which she um, has a number of, uh, you know, along the same theme of this, but it's quite a powerful piece, I'm sure you'd agree. And you can see there almost, as, it's like almost as if there's a torso. Um, so anyway, if, if anyone would like to see this, it, it was, it was uh, ranked as one of the top five um, solo exhibitions to see in Texas um, by a, 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 a reputable magazine um, over there, Arts Magazine. So um, if you can at all try and get on to see her and you'll find her in the uh, Red Bud Gallery, R-E-D-B-U-D gallery.com and then forward slash uh, Colleen dash Blackard, B-L-A-C-K-A-R-D and you'll see all her work. So um, anyway, that's, that, that's for that. The other thing, you know, we do this um, Drawn from the Well, which is an opportunity for viewers to submit some work uh, that they've been working on recently. And we have two this week. And one is from uh, Margie, uh, Margie Dunn. And this one is a small uh, oil painting entitled Essence of the Bog. And the second one is, is by David Goldberg, a fellow member of uh, mine in the United Arts Club. And it's entitled Le Jardin Secret, or The Secret Garden and is an oil painting based in Marrakesh. Okay, so on to um, our guest this morning, and our guest this morning is Bernadette Kiley. Uh, Bernadette Kiley is known the length and breadth of the country, so I feel as if I almost don't have to introduce her. Um, so let's go straight over and we'll, we'll, we'll find out all about her and go down to the beautiful uh, village of Thomastown in, in Kilkenny and say hi to Bernadette. Hi, Bernadette. Hi, Alan. Uh, thank you for asking me to contribute to your series. Not at all, a pleasure. And um, you're, you're down in Thomastown. And Thomastown, for those of you who are outside the country or who don't know it, um, it's a beautiful village uh, with medieval origins there in, in Kilkenny. Um, and it's alongside the Mount Juliet estate with uh, its championship golf course and Michelin starred restaurant and all that sort of thing. But it's an absolutely beautiful place. And we know it from you know my previous career. I, I did some work in the Irish Open, um, and that was held in Mount Juliet right. uh, so many many years ago. Right. But I got to know it then, and more recently because um, my wife Trina knows uh, a woman called Trisha Hennessy, who owns. She's a an award winning chef, and she owns with her husband Michael right. the, the Tower House, which is a beautiful B and B. And their walls, part of the the, the actual construction of that uh, place goes back to um, the 12th century. So well, you're living in quite an ancient and historical place, Bernadette, aren't you? Yes, yes, it is, it is. And it's very, it's, it, it's visible all the time, you know, mm -hmm. so. And it, and it uses your theme quite a lot because the Nor, the River Nor is running through it. Um, yes. You know, and, and, and you pick up on that theme quite a bit, but you, you weren't originally from there, were you? No, I grew up in Carrick on Shore, which mm. is a, um, a town, between Waterford and Clonmel and uh, set on the river shore. And again, a, a very ancient and historic, historic town, which is very visible from the Tudor Manor, the Ormond Castle, which was originally built in the 12th, 13th century, and then added on to by Black Tom Butler. Mm -hmm. We're very aware of that growing up and yes. also the walls of the castle are still visible around mm -hmm. the river shore you know all oh, right okay i wasn't aware of that yeah yeah, yeah. and so you, you grew you were born there were you no i was born in clonmel all oh, right um and uh, literally on the river shore there as well yes um, so there's there's a definite thread um 
My father was in the ESB at the time, so he was transferred to Carrick, so they moved to Carrick, I'm sure. Okay. But, um, and was he interested in art? He was, yes. Yeah, both my parents were interested mm -hmm. in art, yeah. And I, I remember them, actually. I remember us all drawing around the kitchen table in, in um, one of the houses that, that we lived in, you know? Yeah, yes. But the first, the first house in Carrick, uh, was at the end of Bridge Street and it was literally beside the river shore. Mm -hmm. So when we went out, th there was the river, you know. Yeah. And it's the same here where I live now in Thomastown. It's when I go out to the front door, the river is there. I can see the river from upstairs. And tell me, were, I mean, were you always interested in art? Was it something you did, you know, at school to the detriment of everything else? <laughs> Doodling away <laughs> or what? <laughs> I... It was, I didn't do much else, to be honest, <laughs> okay. at, at the time. I remember drawing at the kitchen table from when I was about four. Yes. And, I mean, there was no, there was no fancy drawing pads or, or beautiful paints or anything like that then. So my mother used to give me, um, my mother was a great letter writer, a great writer. She used to give me her um, writing pad, pages from her writing pad, often with the lines on them. And I, the pencils we had in those days were like HBs, you know, those really hard pencils. I didn't like them. You couldn't yeah. see them. So yes. it was her biro, her blue biro. So I drew and drew and drew and drew and drew. <laughs> and anything that was going on, mm. like any dramas or anything happening, I, I just drew people doing um, whatever they were doing. And before, before you, you sort of went to art college and all that, did, did you have in mind any other profession or career in mind? Or, or were you always, no, this is art and that's it? Um, I, I think I, I always wanted to do art. I, hmm. I, I knew, I, I, yeah, I knew I was going to go to, I wanted to go to art school. I wanted to, to do art. But of course, um, you know, as a teenager, you do entertain other, other thoughts at times, like, mm. oh, I love traveling. I want to be an air hostess. And then you go, no, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, um, yes, it was always art. And um, uh, but I do remember my mother's friends actually in the kitchen saying at one point, you can't let her do art. She'll never make any money. Yes. So my, my mother said to me then at one point, um, well, do you want to do painting? And I said, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's too hard. I, I don't think I'd be able to paint. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I remember trying to get a grape to look like a grape. And I was like, how do you do this? You know? <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, and nobody showed me. But, um, mm -hmm. so but I, I mean, paint, painting was, was in fact something you, you, painting you got into fairly, fairly later on in, in, in your career, wasn't it? Because you were more into the graphic end. Well, that's it, you see. And they, they said um, things like, well, maybe you should do commercial art. Mm. At the time, it was called commercial art. So yeah. I went to art school anyway. Mm -hmm. and, Whereabouts? Well, I went to Waterford. And yeah. I, I had actually applied to NCAD and to Limerick and Waterford. I was lucky to get into the mall, but I couldn't afford it. And at the time, I couldn't get a grant. And my sister and brother were also just about to go to college. So, you know, there just wasn't enough money to be spreading around. I mean, they would have done it, but it would have been difficult. Yes. But anyway, I went to Waterford and um, I did foundation, which is, you know, everything. You experience mm. everything. And the teachers there did say to me, they thought I would be good at graphics, that I should do graphics. Mm. So I said, yes, graphic design communications, it was called. Mm. So I did that and um, I, I enjoyed it. it. It was great, actually. I mean, it's a fantastic discipline. And there's a lot of drawing, which I loved drawing. And then the painting is just gouache and flat, flat colour, you know. Sure. So, so that, that sort of leaning, that brought you in a certain direction, didn't it? You, you, now tell me, I don't know whether you went to London first or, or New York. Yeah, I had actually gone to London before I went to college. I mean, the minute I did my leaving search, I was out of Carrick, you know. Let really, me yeah. <laughs> Let me out of here. Um, yeah. So I worked in an, adver an advertising agency in London. I, yes. just, I, mean, I was only 17 then. I just could see what was what, what they were up to, basically. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I thought, well, maybe. But then I went back, went to college. Um, 
I actually went to New York then after I had done two years, or was it two years or three? Two years, I think. And um, I mean, I got a job working in Rosie O'Grady's uh, restaurant and bar, which was great. But I also worked for a man called Felix Gula, who was an architect and designer. Mm. And I was lucky to get that job. And he was one of the, the, the designers of the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Oh, yes. So I got to see that, which was great. So, um, and I did a lot of blueprints and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I came back from New York and did I go to London? Yeah, I went to London. I worked, I worked in uh, Carlo, actually, for a little while in Waterford as a window dresser. Yeah. And then I was like, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> How long did that last? And, but, you know, but it was <clears throat> like trying on different, um, how would you say, disciplines to see if I actually liked them or not. Yeah. I went to London and I got a job with a lovely man, John Wheels Design, and it was an advertising agency. Mm. So I worked with him for about six months, all the advertising. I mean, I was the dog's body. I just did the layout and design and all that. But it was very interesting. And uh, like the others, it told me, no, I don't want to be in the advertising world. It's yeah. and manipulative and I didn't like it, even mm. though I loved coming up with the ideas and stuff. That was really yes. fun, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, So I came back to Dublin and... Did um, you join a magazine? Yeah, yeah. I got, I got a job. But by accident, really, I didn't go for the job. I, mm. I met someone who offered it to me who was looking for someone. Yes. Um, I joined what had been the original music magazine in Ireland called Spotlight. Mm. And by the time I got there, it had it had a new name called, I think, Starlight or something. Yes. I was, was transitioning into um, an, an, a, another form, let's say, because other music magazines had come in, were... were were there then like hot press you know mm. but he he uh, the man who ran it uh, was fantastic he had um i suppose it was the days kind of of the, the 70s and the show bands before that mm. and um there was people like phil linnett coming in and out and it, it was all the music people at, at that time in the late 70s early 80s and glamorous i worked was very glamorous well, I'll tell you, <laughs> it might look like it, but it certainly isn't. No, uh, no. It was really hard work. Um, it was the layout and design of the magazine, which was a really high pressured thing because you were working in, until two o'clock in the morning every every sort of Monday night to get it out. Were you writing it as well? well I were, did you writing, writing were you writing? I wrote stories for it and I, I, I designed... Um, kind of like uh what do you call it like storyboards cartoons yes. i wrote stories in the form of cartoons and put the thought bubbles into their mouths and all that kind of stuff uh, yeah, it lovely fun. it was fun yes um so i was there for almost four years mm. and where did you move to then um i it was sort of sudden i got married then to mm-hmm. shem who um who i had met at art school Yes. And uh, we met when we were 17 and we had kept in contact, even though we were both doing different things. Mm. So I, we, we met again in Dublin because he was at MCAD actually during his, the principles of teaching. Mm-hmm. So we decided to get married and we moved to New Ross first because he was working in a, he had got a job in a school in New Ross and he was from Thomastown. Yeah. So we, 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 um, we moved to New Ross um, outside and then moved into the town. Um, and while there, I actually went back to Waterford and finished off my degree in graphic design because I had gone to America and it was in the back of my mind that I was going to go back to college when I went back. Yes. So I did that for that year. And then we, I, after that, I actually got, I, I, had, I decided that, right, I don't want to do advertising. I don't want to do graphics. I don't want to do fashion, yeah. uh, architecture, the other things I was interested in, because I had tried them all out. Mm. So the job for the Butler Gallery, um, the first administrator of the Butler Gallery came up, and I thought, hmm, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. That sounds really good. So I went for that, and I was very lucky to get the job. Uh, uh, quite a few went for that job, I believe. Yeah. They told me, I think it was 99 people went for it. And, mm. 
they said I, I had got the job for one of the reasons that um, I said I in the interview I said I would if people wanted to know about the art or didn't understand it I said I'd explain it to them you know I, I try to explain what yeah. they're doing where they said most other people had said well if they don't like it they can lump it or something you know exactly <laughs> oh, God not my job <laughs> yeah but um that was that was fantastic you know in that I met um. Like Barry Cook was on the was on the board, um, Paddy Friel. I mean, there was about twelve people on the interview panel. I nearly died when I saw them, you know. Yes. But, um, I met a lot of people who became friends for the rest of a uh, lifelong friends, you mm. know. So it was a very a very good intro into into your art career. It, it was fantastic because mm. I I mean basically it was the days when very few people went into galleries and, and very few people went into the Butler Gallery. It was only really during the summer because it was in the castle, Kilkenny Castle, in the basement of Kilkenny Castle. It was a huge tourist draw. So it was mainly in the summer that droves and droves of people went through it. Yes. But in the winter, like no no one, you know. Really? Yeah. So there was Paddy Friel, who was the curator of the castle, and myself, and we were pretty much the only people in the castle throughout the whole winter. So I got to do a lot of sitting and vigilating and looking at the art on the walls. I remember there was a tremendous exhibition of, um, what's his name, who did all the Ned Kelly paintings? The Australian oh, guy? The Australian, yeah. Um, uh, it'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Yeah, Something I know what you mean, knows. though. Richard Flannery probably knows. Um, but anyway, it was a great introduction in that in, I realized that instead of hanging other people's shows or helping to organize them, which I did enjoy, I wanted to be making the art. Yes. So it was, it was a catalyst into um, the realization that this is something that, you know, will be, will be a challenge, obviously, because I felt I couldn't paint and I, and I couldn't, you know. But it was something that I suppose I felt had the it, it was I, I could see painting as a vehicle for for ex, ex, expression, obviously, emotion, all, all the things that I had seen through big paintings in school and all that kind of stuff. But, was, was there was there anyone who was sort of egging you on all the time or inspiring you or saying, you well, know, on do it? <laughs> yeah. Not, not really at that point. I mean, I, I, I actually um, had my first daughter um, not that long after I left the Butler Gallery. Well, I left because I was pregnant. I had some uh, complications. But um, when she was a baby and uh, asleep in the evening, I, I did start to paint. I decided, right, here's a tiny little room. So I set myself up in it. It was really small. And so when she was gone to sleep, I painted pretty much every night. And I was very lucky in that Barry Cook, who, <clears throat> a lot, uh, you know, you probably know of Barry. He was a tremendous painter. He, he died a few years ago. And he was living next door at, at that point. He had moved from where he was living to the house I'm living in now. And yes. I was living only five minutes away up the street. Mm -hmm. So Barry came to see me and looked at what I was doing and said, yeah, keep going, keep mm. going. And that, in a way, was enough encouragement for me because I really respected his work. I knew his work and I really thought he was great, you know. Yes. And yes. also the fact that he lived, he was living next door was was just wonderful, you know. Mm. And there, 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 there are a huge number of artists of, of all descriptions living around the Kilkenny area. It's a real hotbed of talent, isn't it? It, 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 it is, I suppose. Yeah, we, we tend to forget when, when you're here every day, you don't <laughs> yeah. see anyone, you know? Yes, and, yes. Um, especially now. But um, there is, yeah. I mean, Paul Moss is a great, tremendous artist, lives in Innisfee. His wife, mm -hmm. Marianne, is a great artist. Um, Huey O'Donoghue was, lived here for was it 11 years or, or more? So we saw a lot of Huey and... And I Barry believe was Seamus Heaney was, was a, a, a regular visitor down there. He was, yeah. Seamus was one of Barry, Barry Cook's best friends, mm. as was Ted Hughes, the English Pope Laureate as well. So they yes. visited Barry very regularly. And um, 
they really enjoyed fishing. I mean, fishing was their thing, you know. Yeah. So um, Seamus often would would come down, and I remember going to the local pub, and mm. Seamus basically just told jokes for the whole evening. I mean, one one worse than the other. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Great. Yeah. And listen, before we, we, we get on to, because to, we're going to have a, a look at your studio, but before we do that, do you want to talk about sort of um, various things that you've been involved in, uh, in, in terms of organising or creating um, in, in the local area? Oh, OK, right. Um, well, I, 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 I was very lucky to join the Kilkenny Arts Festival um, board. I won't call it board. It was a visual arts committee. Yeah. I, was, I forget. I was trying to think of the year, and I can't really remember. But it would have been in the nineties. Mm, mm. The nineties, yeah. Okay. And um, Huey O'Donoghue and Claire were living here at the time, so Claire got involved as well. And uh, I mean, because of Claire's contacts and everything in 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 England and the UK, and Huey, we got to put on um, amazing exhibitions. You know, mm. um, there was. And also there was an advance factory uh, given one year or two years, maybe. So it was absolutely huge. And they were so professional in their approach as well that it was a, a great learning experience, you know. Yes. Um, there was Anna Maria Pacheco, David Mack, um, the Swedish guy, Rolf Hansen. I mean, they were all tremendous exhibitions, you know. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful to be involved in, in those and to see the see their work to start off with and to be involved in the organization of that. Yes. And there was a great board uh, on the festival. I mean, Maureen Kennelly was running it and, you know, it, it was just <clears throat> that type of thing in this area, very lucky to be able to be part of the festival. You know? Yes, yes, wonderful, yeah. Um, I was involved as well in, in, in the foundation of of um, the Kilkenny School Project in, in, in Kilkenny. Yeah. My, my daughters both went there. And also an environmental association that we started in Thomastown. I mean, when I moved here, it was very, very quiet. And because I had lived in, you know, Dublin and New York, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> how much happening here? <laughs> you know? So you made it happen. <laughs> well, this is it. <clears throat> You, you have to make things happen yourself. So the Environmental Association was great, and we, we, we did a few things. Um, mm. Trees, which are now huge, and, you know, that kind of thing was really good. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me, I know you have two daughters. Are they involved in art at all, either of them? Well, they are, yes. They? Yeah. Um, my younger daughter, Amelia, is a, did documentary filmmaking, and mm. she's currently doing a, a, a master's, an MA. It's called MA Space. Yes. In um, in Limerick, mm -hmm. and my older daughter Natalia is doing uh, cultural event management at Dunleary D L I A T Dunleary School of Art and Design at the moment. So they they, they are involved in the arts and, and they always have been, but mm -hmm. they have their own um, they have their own way of doing it. Sure. Yes. 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 I think uh, Amelia is there with you. She's your chief technical person. She is, yeah, yeah. Say hello. Come over and say hello. The Alan says, "Come over and say hello." <laughs> <laughs> Embarrass the hell out of her. Hi, how are you? Great. How are you? Thanks for helping your mammy out. <laughs> oh, no problem. It's going great. I'm listening from the sidelines. <laughs> Girl, thank you. Great. Um, okay, so look, let, let's have a look at your studio now. Because you've got, although it's attached to the house, the the Wi-Fi is very strong. So you um, did a little video yesterday with some guidance. And uh, we're going to show that now. Um, so bear with me while I put that on. So this is the studio. It was built in a handball alley by my predecessor, the artist Barry Cook. So it's actually the size of a handball alley. I've put in a couple of dividing walls into it um, just for heating purposes, really, and also to give myself a gallery space at the front of it. Um, so I'll just go through a few, <coughs> a few things here and um, we'll just start over here. I was very lucky to get these um, former hospital beds 
uh, that will be thrown out of the local hospital. And I have two of them, and they're absolutely brilliant. You can rise them up and lower them if you want to. And um, these are just some folders um, that I keep um, photographs in and um, kind of source material um, when I need um, some inspiration. And um, these are just some books I have stacked up here. Um, I love books and I'm addicted to buying even more art books um, than I have already, which is quite a lot. And um, these are just some notebooks. I have a lot of other notebooks as well over here in this uh, plan chest, if you could actually see it. It's, it's full of uh, notebooks, folders of drawings, um, that kind of thing. Um, sketchbooks, um, a lot of pads for writing as well, a lot of notes that I take from books and articles and all that kind of stuff. These are just a few. Uh, this is a um, Duchamp little sculpture that I love. Um, that's an artist I really like as well, William Kentridge, amazing drawings, an amazing artist. Tin whistles for the old blow. <laughs> um, these are <coughs> a selection of photographs turned upside up, turned upside down, and mainly of images I take myself as source material for the work. Um, these are some materials, and um, these are all those. I went mad in Lidl recently and bought a load of these brushes, which I think are absolutely great and really cheap. And I'm not precious about them, so I, I don't care about cleaning them or anything like that, which is, I don't like doing anyway. Um, I paint here. I tend to go for the Winsor and Newton because they're the easiest to get um, around here in Kilkenny. Um, I even got some Bob Ross here just to see what it's like. But I'm going to get a new batch now, and I'll probably get some Michael Harding and Old Holland to move in <coughs> to put in with them as well. Um, I use tins for, for solvent, which I know is, isn't the healthiest and in fact very unhealthy. So, but some of them do contain the zested solvent, which is organic, and a lot of the others contain uh, just white spirit. And the spirit is different colours, which I use to pour every, sometimes I use, or often I use to pour on canvases when I need just a hint of a certain colour. So I mix more spirit in with it and do that. I tend to mix the colour in tins as I like to keep the colours separate rather than on a big palette, for example, that's mixed in together. And I keep bins of rags and um, what's an easel, and another easel, um, canvases. I tend to buy all my canvases because I'm not a person who's able to stretch canvases. I don't have the strength. And I buy them from the large ones from the Millican Brothers and the smaller ones from Evans or the Art Materials Company. Um, this is some of the work I've been doing um, since the lockdown started. It's difficult to see the whole lot together, so I'll just try and get back as far as I can. Um, they're <clears throat> the same <clears throat> team that I've been using for a long time, which is my immediate environment what I see around me. Uh, but this time, instead of um, focusing, we'll say, on specific details of the landscape, I have taken the viewpoint of somebody who is um, locked inside, as we all are at the moment, and I'm looking through um, the, the branches and trees from um, that I can see when I look out the window, I can see from far. Or I can see as maybe I'm walking along and I'm looking through and looking out and through branches, trees, and that type of thing. And I'm just going to turn around here now and we'll just look at the last few paintings. This is work I've been working on at the moment and they're not finished, any of them. So this is a painting of the empty garden. Uh, dark pool of flood water on the street at night. Well, I've been doing a series of uh, paintings from the walks I take at night and uh, in the morning. And, um, this is one of the river from outside my house. And this is one of the county of 
hospital, which is where we are. So, um, that was great. That was great. Thank you for that. I, I think I, hopefully people were able to listen or hear it because the sound was a wee bit low. We, we might we might try and um, increase that for the video. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, it, it gives a very good flavour of, of your studio. I thought what was interesting was was your your complete disregard for fancy um, brushes and the fact that you you mix your paints in these tins mm -hmm. like sardine can <laughs> tins and stuff, um, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love sardines. <laughs> you love sardines. Ah, that explains everything. <laughs> I have to a lot of them to get the tins, you know? <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. I'm not so, um, about materials. Um, say that again, sorry. I'm not really precious about materials, you know? No. I've seen artists with the most amazing brushes that last them for years. And, and that's great, you know? But... Um, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I'm just not like that. That's just not me. That's the way I tend to work. You yeah. just throw them away, get a new batch, you know. I know. And, and tell me, are you, what, what sort of schedule do you keep during the week? Are you an early morning person or are you a late bird? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of both, you know. Um, mm. I work every day. I work every day during the week. I treat it kind of like a job. I get up go for a walk, you know, eat the breakfast, do what I have to do, and I and then I go to work. So yeah. I'm there until I'm tired and or until it's dinner time. And I, I, I sometimes do work on a Saturday afternoon as well, but mainly I, I, I don't work on Sunday unless it's an emergency and I have to. Yeah. And um, so it's kind of like uh, I, I, I treat it like a job. I go to it. It's my job. I go to it the same as everyone else goes to their job. Yes. But I would have worked a lot at night when my children were small. Yes. And in bed because I'd have to, you know, I'd be with them during the day. As soon as they were asleep, I'd go in, maybe work until 12 or 1 o'clock. I know. But and I noticed you, you have quite a few paintings on the walls there. Um, um, are you the sort of person who will... Uh, you know, work on several different paintings at one time, or do you like to complete something before you move on to something new? No, I, I work on, on paintings, uh, <clears throat> several on the go, because yeah. I mentioned there in the video that I tend to pour paint or pour like white, the, bits of paint. Yeah, yeah, part of what I do, I pour paint on the surface, not all of the canvases, hmm. but some of them. It's um, the reason I do that is because if I do pour paint on one uh, canvas, I have to wait for that to dry. So while I'm waiting, I start another one. And, and I suppose if I, if I do something on, say this, I work a bit on this canvas, I wait a little bit to see what I need to do next. Mm. So I might start the other one. So mm. in a way it gives me more of a sense of what I'm actually doing if I have four or five or yeah, as many. It, 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 it wouldn't be more than four, but when I'm working on the bigger paintings, it wouldn't be more than two, really, you yes. know, unless yeah. I was doing a triptych or something like that. And tell me, do, do you plan out your paintings? You know, do you take photographs? Do you do sketches? Do you, do you have a, a sketchbook? What's your sort of process in the lead up to starting yeah. a painting? It's mainly photography, Alan. You know, my, my third arm is, is a camera, really. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always, I always have my phone now, I'm kind of alert to imagery wh wherever I go, you know. Mm. I do a lot of drawing, uh, all right, but they're not like preparatory sketches for anything else. They're more me gathering information, you know, yeah. just for myself. Yeah. And I've made um, some very large drawings, which I think you might see one or two of them in the slideshow. Yeah. But, but they're drawings for themselves. Mm. objects you know okay um so i tend to take a lot of photographs then i go to an editing process um i edit them out then i edit again then i edit again and then i select a number yes I follow a theme that i'm i'm on or i want to explore okay and so i print off the photographs uh, from the computer Mm -hmm. and I have them then in the studio and you saw them all turned upside down because right. I'm 
That's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, look. Let's 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 go straight on to to um, the, the presentation. Now, you picked out a number of of works, and I think that 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 will sort of help viewers see the progression of your career and okay. you know all sorts of different stories that that have happened during that. Yes. So um, I'll st I'll share the screen now. I'll, I'll try and be briefish. Yeah. And I think we're starting here in around it, it's 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 the nineties anyway, mm -hmm. and so it, you know in order to keep um, a certain amount of images, I decided to start here. So the these in a way uh, the paintings that you see fall into the bracket, I suppose, at the time of kind of elemental and an effort on my part to capture smoke and fire, which um, it was really difficult to do, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I made a series of small fires burning in the landscape. Um, before, just before we had heard that there was an EU directive coming in to stop burning in the landscape. So it, it was an effort on my part to sort of, in a way, capture something that I knew was going to disappear. Yes. So um, that also feeds into the um, subject matter, which is fire and smoke, which of course is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I'd have to say all of my work is related to ephemeral subject matter, which you can only grasp a moment in time of. It's not solid. It's, it's, it tends to be, well, air, really. I mean, you know. <laughs> just to, to use that metaphor. So anyway, this is um, an oil, oil painting, a reasonably small, I think 36 by 46, which is the size I tend to use. Mm -hmm. And um, it's from one of the series called Fire, Two Dots is to Burn, which is like a phrase from Latin, you know, where we, where we learned fire and the the other thing is like is to burn that's what it means you know yes okay so move on. On to the next one alan please mm -hmm. um this is from a, a series of paintings i made as a result to going to uh, the ballon glen arts foundation which is the most wonderful place in north mayo and i, I have been invited a couple of times and i just thought gosh i, I don't really have a much of a connection with up there but then I remembered that we had been to visit the cage of fields previous to that with my husband and children. And it was the most magnificent place on the, on the edge of uh, the North Mayo coast with the visible remains of 5,000 years were standing on this, you know, boggy earth. And I, I just remember feeling kind of, my God, this is such a profound connection to our heritage and our country, you know, like, it was mind blowing. So I went up there and it was probably the best thing I've ever done. Um, so this is just one. I did a lot of um, bog cotton growing out of the bog and also um, gorse, which which was bloomed everywhere the first time I was there. And um, I suppose the reason I, I decided to make the gorse paintings was I really had no affiliation with with yellow. The colour yellow, I, I sort of found it a little bit harsh and, and garish, and I really actually didn't like it, and I hadn't been using it. So it was so yellow, I thought, I, I, I'll give it a go and see if I, can, if I can make something of it. So I made a whole series of the gorse and um, bog cotton paintings, which is very big, uh, I think six, almost six foot. Is that really? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. So if, if you want to move, yeah. So after coming, coming back from uh, the Ballon Glen Arts Foundation, anyway, time, time moved along. I'm not quite sure when this was, some, sometime in the, two, in the 2000s. Yes. I decided to set myself a task of, because the river is right outside the door, mm -hmm. and I wanted to make work about the river and how, how I saw it on a daily basis, because of course, every time you look, it's different. And every mm -hmm. time you look out the door, it's different. And every time you look at a tiny little thing, it's moved and shifted. So there's constant flux movement all the time. So I decided if I could, if I could set myself the task of just looking out the window or just walking out the door and to make work about the stretch of river that I could just see, 
uh, uh, from my peripheral vision, you know, which is only about 80 foot. So I, I set myself upon this task and ended up making a lot of work. Um, which, where did you display these? Where, 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 had you a relationship with Taylor Gallery at this point? I did. I, oh, I did, yeah. yeah. Mm. I joined the Taylors in about 19, I think it was 97, actually. Yes. Um, so these were first exhibited at the Ballina Art Centre in, mm. in North Mayo, actually, this group of works. Okay. And the, the previous work, um, the Bob Cotton, that, that um, or sorry, the Gorse painting, uh, they all went into an exhibition called Local Ground, a slow time local ground, which actually toured to the Butler Gallery, the Model Arts Centre and the Millennium Court Arts Centre in um, Portadown uh, County, Armagh. So this went to the Ballina Arts Centre and I think maybe subsequently to Taylor Galleries as well. Mm. I'd have to look up the, um, the biography or the, the CV to see exactly where they all fit into each other. Okay. So, yeah. Matter of interest, do you do you frame your paintings? I don't, Alan. No. no. Okay. I don't frame, uh, get drawings framed, small drawings. Framed. Yes. I don't get the big drawings framed, but people do frame the paintings. Themselves. Would you rather leave that up to the person who buys it? Yeah, yeah. and I have seen uh, paintings of mine framed, and and they do look well in in a very simple frame, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. This is a larger painting. It's um, a size I tend to use quite a lot, which is uh, 103 by 148, well, 100 by 150 almost. Mm. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the kind of early uh, paintings, I'll call them flood paintings, that I started to do. Because it, it, even though the river outside had flooded, a couple of times coming up to that, it, it, it became more prevalent as time went on and the, and the flooding happened almost, it was beginning to happen almost every year and sometimes even twice a year. And then of course, um, it became very obvious that climate change had started to become discussed big time in, 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 the, um, in the media. And it became more and more apparent that this was obviously happening and actually we could see it outside our front door, you know. Yes. yes. So um, it led on to <clears throat> a series, a, a lot about flooding. Yeah. Uh, these, these are um, again from the river. So it was like a kind of an all encompassing um, project to make work about water, I suppose, the effects of water what forms water takes because, I mean, these are drawings related to fog, mist, snow, and all those are just water in, in, in their other forms, water vapor in their other forms. So I like that idea how water was changing what I was looking at and yes. how, how it did it amazingly. And um, the canvases are five foot by seven. Um, and I, I would have ordered a lot of them from um, Millican Brothers in, in a Grey Abbey outside Belfast. Um, Do you ever use acrylics or are you using oils all the time? Oh, no, they're made with charcoal. Oh, sorry, these, yes. Sorry. Okay. They're drawings with, with charcoal and chalk. And it's, it's ordinary school chalk, but it, you can get it in big plastic containers. Like they're huge, big, thick sticks. The same way as you can get the big, thick charcoal sticks yes yes a box of them which is going to last me for my life and the and the chalk as well so and wh when you when you've done that using charcoal how, how do you protect the canvas because charcoal obviously is something that rubs off relatively easily it is yeah do, do, do you do you glaze them or something well i spray spray them with spray them. yeah so i mean they would take about four or five tins each really? one. yeah yeah no it, it is it's a bit of a process and I, I would spray as well as I drew as I drew at a certain point where you think, well, I want to fix that so I can work over it. Yes. So you'd spray it then again. And then as many times as if you touch it, it's not going to come up, come away in your hat. You know what I, I mean? Know. I know. Do you ever use water over charcoal? I do. Yeah. That can fix it too. It does. Yeah. Well, well I, I would have tend to pour water or spray it, actually. You know those little sprays yeah. for plants? Plants, yes. 
yeah. Yeah. Spray water, it dislodges the charcoal and chalk and just gives it that little kind of edge as if things are shifting, which of yeah. course they are. Yes. Uh, in a way, um, I suppose a good bit of what I would do would be to try and technically achieve something that I felt I wanted to and mm -hmm. and then try and figure out well how, how am I going to do that you know yeah okay and this is uh, again part of that series which is this very it was a very small tree but mm -hmm. so kind of shrouded in I, I really didn't know is that snow is it ice is it fog yeah what is it but it was just so kind of stark and magnificent even though it was small yes so um i, I think i made this one before the other three sure. yeah anyway these these are parts of uh, the series that you saw all of the small pieces together mm -hmm. and uh lar larger larger paintings again as you can see of the river and at, at different times um early morning in the middle, sometime during the day, very bright sunlight and at night. Uh, Isn't it shopping. extraordinary, the difference? It's extraordinary. And they're all from literally outside the door. Oh, they, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's what, Wonderful. What I can see, you know. Wonderful. Um, you recognise this woman. <laughs> um, during the last big flood, uh, which was uh, 2016, I think, on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve or around that time anyway. And because the whole country was flooded, um, Minister Joan Burton uh, was arrived um, in Thomastown. And unfortunately herself and um, Anne Phelan, I think the Labour Party um, uh, minister from uh, Craignamana, were being towed around in this boat and they fell out right outside the front door <laughs> and poor Joan and poor Anne now fair, you know fair play to them they you ran out of your camera did you and said, well, do that again run. do that again um, I didn't run out of my camera uh, yeah. I, I used imagery that other other people had taken and but it happened outside the front door so I thought I have to document this yeah you know. does she know about it I don't know if she knows about it. Somebody bought it, which I'm very surprised that somebody would buy it. But um, I, I don't know if she knows about it. But, yeah. you know, maybe eventually I'll send her a copy of it. You'll send her a copy of this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So um, these were par part of uh, the f flooding series as well. And... Um, I happened to be on the train from Dublin to Galway with my daughter, Amelia. We were going down to her graduation, actually, ceremony. Mm -hmm. And this was before kind of any big flooding. But as we went along, the whole Shannon River, you know, was really flooded. Yes. And it was before the floods. So uh, we realized, I realized myself how much uh, the Shannon actually floods before there's even any mention of a flood. Mm. And of course, I know that flooding as well is also good for irrigation and all that. But, but I mean, this it was not. So anyway, I took a, an awful lot of photographs the whole way down and I made this, uh, this, this kind of, I mean, they're individual pieces, but I just have them together here yeah. uh, of flooding on the Shannon. Mm -hmm. Which brought me to, um, or led me to an exhibition that uh, happened in the Lewin Gallery in Athlone, which is literally on the Shannon. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a beautiful gallery. If you lovely, lovely gallery. Yeah. Uh, fabulous, you're standing, uh, looking out the window, literally on the River Shannon. So mm -hmm. they did a, an exhibition of mine called um, So Much Water So Close to Home. And these are some of the paintings. There was two walls with nine paintings on each end and all based around flooding both um, here in, in, in my hometown, Carrick on Shore and other parts of the world which I felt were important to me. Right. About yeah. family connections, we'll say, uh, places, yeah. 
I mean, places where my family would uh, were living, like in, in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, also, parts of the east where we ha- we had grown when we had well, growing up in Carrick and Shore. I mean, there was an awful lot of flooding, mm-hmm. and. Um, I remembered either seeing it on the newspaper. My father used to always get National Geographic. And I could, you know, I remember looking through and seeing all the flooding in places like Pakistan or was yeah. it Bangladesh or those places. And I remember thinking, it's not just us, it's everywhere, you know. Bernadette, would you like me to go back to that one? Uh, which one is that? Pre- the previous one, this one here? No, no. no? no okay, all right, okay. Yeah. That you're on is, is the one I, yeah the one I'm talking about so okay. um, so yes I wanted to make work about flooding that um, was was worldwide you know so it was like literally you know often I suppose the local is universal and what you see outside your own own door is is happening throughout the world and also I really liked the um, idea of the tra- the tracks the train tracks you mm. know. And the fact that they couldn't be used. So I mean, transport uh, came to an end because of climate climate change. You know. Okay. So um, this is this is a painting based on the river in Carrick on Shore, where I grew up, and um, my my mother had died and my father had died previously. So I. I, I was going down to visit the grave every week, pretty much, and, and then going for a walk up the bank of the river there, which is beautiful. Mm. And one day I saw this very small little boat kind of tucked in, you know, mm. in, in, at the side of the river there. And um, the fact that it had the yellow lines and the shape of it, and you could see the reflection. It just was a very small little boat and it was almost like it kind of squeezed in under a bush just uh, as, to create a little safe harbor for itself. And it just struck me because I had been so, I suppose, upset and grief stricken that my mother had died uh, so suddenly. Uh, I, 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 I was thinking about uh, Carrick on Shore and how it had always been a safe harbor for, for, for my family and I to go because my parents were all, always there. But now they weren't, you know. So I, I saw it as, um, a place where there was no longer a safe harbor, you know. So I, I called the painting, uh, I, I wanted to make the painting about it and I saw the boat as kind of metaphorical again. Yeah. And it was like, no safe harbor. You know, it was a realization, there's no safe harbor. So yeah. that's the title of that painting. And it's a big one again, it's, a, you know, it's 150. Yeah, very atmospheric. I might have been looking at Monet at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so this this is um, an exhibition I did. I uh, was it last year or the year before? I can't remember now with this mm-hmm. pandemic. Um, at the Source Art Center, Source Gallery in Terlis, which is a beautiful gallery, really mm-hmm. lovely. And what was it called? Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Don't worry, don't worry. Is the painting again? They're they're all related to flooding, the river, um, drawings, charcoal drawings, paintings. The one on the right, bottom right here, I'll just talk about that briefly. It's called um, it's a painting based from from Carrick, I'm sure, and it just brings me back to the previous painting I mentioned about the train, the railway track going yes. through the water. And mm-hmm. this is an image I saw and I took from uh, Carrick and Shore during flooding where it was it's the railway track and I used to walk the railway tracks when I was a teenager I mean that would show you the fun that was to be had in Carrick I mean walking the tracks was the, <laughs> the height of the fun you know <laughs> like anyway yeah, yeah. flooded completely I mean you know a, a very ob- obvious um very obviously, no one was going anywhere, you know. Sure. But so uh, I, I decided to make the painting, and it's called No No Train Coming, Flood on the Tracks, which is, if anybody is a fan of Bob Dylan, they, they'll be able to relate that to um, 
is it what's what's the title someone will tell me um well they will <laughs> some blood on the tracks anyway yeah yeah and i think there is no train coming but a blood on the tracks and the reason i called it that was because this is um only this lo the location of this painting <clears throat> the railway tracks is down um only down the road from a place where it was owned by one of the clancy brothers sisters and her husband and apparently bob dylan came over there to play with the clancy brothers mm -hmm. and we always felt that connection so that's why i used that title very good yeah yeah and the rest yeah so uh, this is this painting is actually in that exhibition that we just saw a second ago in Perlis, mm -hmm. and it's six foot by seven it's called somewhere we somewhere we know and it, it was made during the time where there was this tremendous burnings all over the California and then mm -hmm. happening in Australia. And my brother lived very close to where uh, that those fires, uh, the Santa Rosa fires, I think they were called, or the Tubbs fires, mm -hmm. near a town called Paradise, which and the town of Paradise burnt to the ground. Yes, really. Yeah, and it was it was a, a town of like. A, a, a town of very wealthy people who had absolutely beautifully um, very expensive houses. Yes, yes, yes. And the whole place seemed again like a metaphor, you know. Absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. My God. Um, I made the painting as uh, <clears throat> an image. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll move swiftly on because we want to get to the Q and A. I know. I'm, yeah. Yeah. This brings us to the last exhibition I did at Taylor Galleries, which was called um, uh, One Touch of Nature Makes the Whole World Kin. Mm -hmm. And it included uh, paintings related to flooding. Now, this would be the quayside in Carrick, I'm sure, this painting of where I grew up right yes. beside it. And even though they built a wall, it still floods. Of course it does. Um, so this was just a little piece that Aidan Dunn had uh, written in the Irish Times and it, he related it to the pandemic because obviously isolation became a big thing during, mm -hmm. and has become a big thing during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. These are uh, paintings um, were shown in the Taylor Galleries as part of that exhibition, which was flooding, burnings um, and the isolation of, I suppose, just looking through, looking out from, from within. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think this is very interesting because it's, it's taking a different angle on isolation. And I rather like these. So can you tell us the story about how you ended up creating this series? Okay. Um, because, well, the first lockdown, and I suppose it was just such a shock, for, it was it was a shock for everybody um, so I, I i thought about it and how we were all now had to stay at home and um I, I i i go for a lot of walks i mean i tend to walk every morning and every night so during the first lockdown when it was all very eerily quiet i was walking around every night and it became very apparent very quickly to me that i was the only person in the town now it would have been late half 10 maybe 11 o'clock at night and so i started thinking about all the people and and them all being inside and everybody being locked in and and like nobody out and you know how do they feel about it were they terrified inside or were they okay or you know mm. So that kind of thinking became, um, you know, kind of obvious, just there in my mind. And so instead of uh, looking at the river or what the landscape that I would have done, I started to take photographs of, of the windows and the lights. And it would have been something I, I was always interested in anyway, would be mm. architecture, buildings, townscapes, streets, and shadow a lot. Mm -hmm. I've made a lot of work about shadow. So they became kind of um, images of um, looking inwards and yeah. looking outwards. And I mean, I'll just mention this little painting for example. What uh, was, um, is the windows of, a, or are the windows of a, what used to be a really popular bar 
that had amazing people come. Amazing this people. one here? Yeah. And um, it, it, it closed down, you mm. know, closed down and, and all that life and all that kind of, I suppose, fantastic um, joy that it brought mm. people just died. So in, in a way, they, 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 some of them, they're like memories of when there was other things happening and, and now there's nothing, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, during the pandemic, uh, they, they, the council had been building um, a, a new car park, which is pretty much, it's next door to us here. It used to be the paddock, but now it's turned into a car park. And because of the pandemic, all the buildings stopped. Yes. So it remained like this for months. And so every night I, I would pass it and every day I'd pass it. So it, it almost became a symbol to me of being caged in, you know, mm. the, the, and also I suppose I just liked the look. I like yeah. I liked the look of this sort of place, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's yeah. something happening that was unusual. Um, this is, this is um, a painting uh, again related to to floating and it's 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 based on a, an area of Carrick on shore um up a bit from where my mother would have lived mm. and now this is an image I didn't take it myself I took it from somewhere I don't know actually mm. but it reminded me of I mean I just thought it was just so sad this this what looks like an elderly lady having to plow her way to a flood with, yeah. with nobody else around. And it reminded me of my mother and other people like her, you know. Vulnerable people, yeah. But it's quite a, a, a poignant image, especially she's got the handbag on her shoulder, which says Noel, which mm. is obviously sometime, you know, she got the bag at Christmas or something. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's it. Now, um, because of time, right, and I want I want to get people in. Um, one question I tend to ask at the very end, but I'll ask it before the very end. And oh. that is, if you were to um, be allowed, take, steal, grab, whatever, any piece of artwork, um, be it a piece of sculpture, a classic car, a lovely painting, anything at all, what would you pick? Money, no object. Or maybe there's two things. I chose two paintings, and they're both related to houses and home which i think are very pertinent uh, obviously home has become so, such ma so massively important to us all over the past year and we've all been locked inside and the first painting here is from or is by a, a guy called george shaw who's a uk artist um young enough i'd say he's not even 50 yet and yeah. um, he i absolutely love his work and this painting is called ash wednesday you know which is the time of year that we're in mm. so that's another reason but it just evokes uh, and it's also i think ash wednesday 7 30 in the morning and it just evokes a time when that i remember really well from going to mass during lent at like half seven every morning yeah. uh, and walking along and, and just seeing the houses and housing estates around the town i think it just has an amazing atmosphere yeah yeah. It's, it's the life is so beautiful and he uses this oh yeah right and this, sorry Bernadette no that's okay I know I'm <laughs> rabbiting on here no you're not you're fine um, this is the little street by Johannes Vermeer and it was made in 1657 I think which is mind-blowing in itself even to think about that yeah. and it, it, it's just again it's absolutely stunning painting so beautiful but it evokes again the home and just people you know, th this was his widowed aunt in the doorway and, and she was sewing and two people on the pavement and I don't know, maybe drawing or playing or something, the lady in the, in the alleyway. And it, there's just such a sense of, I suppose, acceptance and, and, and happiness and, and beauty about that image. Yes. So those are the two paintings I, I would be extremely happy to, to look at every day. Very good, very good, lovely. Um, Bernadette, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. No, you. I think I think we almost covered everything. There might be one or two areas we didn't, but by and large, 
I, I think I think we, we we did. Oh, it was Sydney Nolan. That's the chap you were yeah, thinking of. Yeah, that's Sydney that's Nolan. That's right. yeah. yeah, I know the name too, but yeah, some fabulous work he's done. Um, Beatrice says, I remember seeing Anthony Tappies, is it? Anthony Tappies, yeah, yeah. Anthony Tappies, I knew I got that wrong. In the Butler Gallery, made yeah. a big impression. Yeah, fantastic Beatrice. exhibitions, yeah. yeah. Uh, love William Kentridge. Mm. Amazing, yeah. Uh, yeah, fab, really inspiring, says Beatrice. Um, Bridget Flannery says, beautiful work. Marianne, great work. Catherine, love your new work. Are the landscapes around your home? Sorry, are these landscapes around your home? I think they are, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yes, they are. They're, really, they're yeah. within 20 feet, <laughs> you know, yeah. Exactly. Um, what is so lovely about, about Thomastown? Beautiful work, says Jean. Yvonne says, very atmospheric work, Yvonne. David Goldberg, what is the mixture you use to pour paint? It's a, a solvent. It, it, yeah, it's a solvent, solvent and color. So the solvent, either white spirit or maybe a little bit of linseed, and um, or if I'm using the zestus, you know, the 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 more organic, yeah. whatever solvent I'm using. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jean asks, do you use a limited palette? Not not consciously. I I don't set out to limit myself to any color. I tend to go with the color that I, I suppose, want to use for that image. Mm. Um, and they tend to be the imagery that I, I work with. Well, they're landscape images, so the color yeah. can be quite limited, you know. Okay. Carol says, lovely to hear and see Bernadette. Thank you. Um, Miriam McConnon, who's in Cyprus, says, uh, it's wonderful to hear you talk about your inspiration and work and to gain a greater insight into your practice. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Yvonne Maloney O'Keefe says, amazing to see your loose way of working the oil paintings, uh, coming, as you said, from a graphic former training. Yes, quite different, isn't it? I mean, really, you know. Pamela says, beautiful work. Um, Bridget Flannery says, apologies, I must leave. Wonderful to hear you, Bernie, and many thanks, Alan. She knows you well, she calls you Bernie. Happy Easter to all. Thanks, yeah. Um, Elaine says, extraordinary atmosphere. It is wonderful how you talk about your work. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Tom says, spectacular and haunting, really beautiful. Uh, David Newton, I so love the wonderful painter, Lena. Sorry, my, my eyes are getting a bit goggle-eyed. Um, you use, and the great sense of atmosphere across your work. The boat and the light around it is exquisite. That's from David. Thanks, David. Larry, to everyone. Thank you, Bernadette, for a great talk and beautiful work. Carol, thank you, Bernadette, for your talk. Rupert says things are moving all the time, uh, so we don't have to. Yeah. Reminds me of the phrase, the less you move, the more you see. Really beautiful. Yeah, that's, right. and that's Rupert in Germany. Marianne says, thank you so much. Love the atmospheric paintings. Beatrice, thanks so much, B. Yes. Yeah. This work, as always, kiss, kiss. Mm -hmm. uh, Malachi, fantastic indeed, Bernadette. Thank you for the view into your work and life. Jane German says, great to see so much of your work, Bernie, and to hear about your inspiration. Thank you. uh, and finally, Aileen says, thank you. That was a really interesting and engaging. Uh, it was really interesting and engaging. Thank you for that. I would like to say something. Uh, good morning, Bernadette. Who's that? Derek Cully from Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah. The amazing, an amazing introduction to your work for me. What I find very strange is you're such a humble person and your work is of genius. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. You're welcome. Um, Cabrini, oh, Cabrini Lynch here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Bernadette. It's really, really inspiring, wonderful work. But um, how much did uh, Barry Cook influence you in the beginning? Because some of your work, like um, that big yellow one out there on the, over by Ballinglen, the Cady Fields, was very like an influence of his work. Um, yeah, right. Okay. Um... I'm not sure how 
his, I mean, I think his work would have influenced my work. Yes, uh, definitely. I, as, as did a lot of others as well, you know. But um, I suppose it wouldn't be a conscious thing, maybe. It would be more the unconscious um, absorptions that we, we all tend to take in, you know, like being like sponges as artists, we tend to soak up so many different influences, you know. Yeah. Those, the KG Fields ones were more about experimentation on my part as to see how I could get this to work, you know. So I, I did start to pour paint, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank very nice. Yeah. Very, very possibly. Yes. Yeah. yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sabrini. Um, anybody else? I was just thinking there while, while Cabrini was asking that question, could it have been the individual as against his art that inspired you? Who seemed to be quite a, an inspirational individual. Oh, he was. He was. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, Barry was a biologist <clears throat> before he became an artist, before he did art history. He? He, 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 didn't, he wouldn't have studied painting either, only he, he, he did it himself, you know. Yeah. He did biology and art history, so he would have been very interested in, in the environment, uh, massively so, you know. So, Bernadette, thank you very, very much on behalf of all of us um, for allowing us into your home and into your studio. And it was just such a wonderful visit and, and, and very, very inspiring, I think, to a lot of people just to see how you work. And I know you absolutely devour art from the morning <laughs> you wake up, you're reading, aren't you? Uh, uh yeah, a bit, yeah. A yeah. fair bit. There's fair not bit. much else to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, you're, you're a busy woman, I know that for sure. Um, but look, it was wonderful. A very happy Easter to you, and thank you so much for being part of this. Take care, everybody. Look after yourselves, look after each other, and a very happy Easter to you all. And thank you so much, Bernadette. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was terrific. Okay.